TurnCycle Solutions and Granite State Solar, you're open to contact any company that you wish for whichever service. Uh, however, if you want to be part of the group purchase discount in the campaign, uh, you would need to go through TurnCycle Solutions and Granite State Solar um, in order to get that discount for the campaign. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention about the campaign, which I think will make it so successful, is that we have a great, great group uh, of volunteers and municipal support for the campaign. And our volunteers um, are here to help us with outreach of the campaign. They're going to be staffing events. They're going to be canvassing neighborhoods. Um, and they're just volunteering to help drive sustainability in Nashua and in Hudson. Ultimately, we want to get 100 solar PVs uh, from this campaign, uh, 100 solar PV installations. And we want to get 100 weatherization installations from this campaign. Um, and these volunteers are going to help us do it. So I would like to recognize, um, and if you're in the room, please stand up, uh, Kathy Abel, uh, Cynthia Nunez, uh, Hillary Grups, uh, Emily Guo, uh, Amy McDonough, and Jim Pyle. Thank you so much for volunteering and supporting the efforts of the campaign. We really appreciate all you do. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, so let's get into uh, some logistics for tonight. Uh, we do have, as I said earlier, our two installers here. Um, they are going to be each providing a 30-minute presentation. Uh, what I will request uh, is that you take notes, if you can, during your, the presentation of your questions, and then hold on to those questions. And after the presentations are over, um, we're going to have plenty of opportunity to do an open Q&A session. Um, so that way we can stay organized and really get through the agenda um, and making, make sure we're using everybody's time efficiently. All right, so without any further ado, I will introduce Eric Shiflett from Granite State Solar. Thank you, Arden. I'm going to take the mic because I like to move around and I don't know, this looks stern, but I want to be a little more friendly. Uh, my name is Eric Shiflett. I'm the co-owner of Granite State Solar. Uh, Granite State Solar was founded in 2008 by my business partner, Alan Gaunt. Uh, that's uh, when the housing market sort of tanked. Alan was a builder and decided that uh, solar maybe would go somewhere someday, and I think he was right. Uh, the last few years in particular have been a real fantastic hockey stick curve of up uptick in solar interest in New Hampshire. Uh, I partnered up with Alan in 2014 and so uh, together and all together granite state solar has been in the solar business for 10 years solar companies are relatively new 10 years is like dog years okay so that's like 70 years if you think of it that way um, we are very proud of our accomplishments and the way that we run the company i think one of the reasons that we were selected here is, is for that sort of in a nutshell um, we always have to do what we say we're going to do. And if we give somebody a quote and we haven't done our job properly on the back end and done the right good site visit and we make a mistake or overlook something, that quote is a quote and we will eat it if we make a mistake and that's how we learn from mistakes. And I think that's one of the things you will see if you were to Google Granite State Solar and look at what our customers say. They say that we work hard to keep them happy and to do what we say we're going to do. And we really rely on our clients for referrals and our health of our business and our future growth. So that's sort of our ethos. Um, we treat our employees well. Everybody is full time. Everybody's year round. We don't do annual layoffs or temps. Everybody lives here in New Hampshire, buys homes, has kids, is getting married. Um, everybody gets health insurance. So when our installers show up at your house, you're talking to people who are holding their head high and happy with what they're doing, and they're just as slick as the salesperson that was out there. It's not like the usual trade situation where everything falls apart on installation. Um, we really uh, value all of our employees, and I think that people who work with us uh, see that, and they see that they're working with people who enjoy what they do. So enough about Granite State Solar. Let me tell you a little bit more about the Solarize, on the Nashua Solarize campaign, a little bit more about um, solar in general to give you a little bit of education, Solar 101, and uh, then we'll get into uh, pricing and some of the details that I'm sure you're wondering about, like what is the deal with Nashua Solarize. So uh, I think Arden already went over the goals. We would like to get 100 systems installed here in Nashua and Hudson. And uh, to do that, 
uh, we're going to be talking about the benefits of solar when you put solar on your roof or on the ground, what do you get? Um, a lot of people like solar because it's a green thing, but we're going to talk to everybody throughout this campaign about literally the nuts and bolts and what's the return on investment and what does it do for you. Um, you, can, you, can redu you can recoup a solar investment by offsetting an electric bill. You can uh, potentially eliminate electric bill if you're creating a surplus, which you're credited monetarily, and you can receive a check from the utility for that. You can add value to your home. Every system that we install is owned by the homeowner. We don't do leases or power purchase agreements. Um, every homeowner gets all of the value of the solar on their roof or on the ground. That's uh, when the house so sells, it should sell for more money. Uh, and that's always a plus because not many people stay in their homes for 25 years, which is at least the life, the, the array is going to last at least 25 years. If you're selling sometime in that time frame, you should realize a benefit from the resale value of the home. And you can even use solar electricity to offset oil and propane and other heating and cooling expenses. Modern mini split systems, ductless systems, air source heat pump hot water heaters, they're incredibly efficient. They're a great way to use electricity to add BTUs of heat to the house instead of using oil and, and uh, propane. So oftentimes when we're designing a system, we will consult with what are you going to change? Are you going to add mini splits? Are you going to adjust your heating system? Maybe change that electric hot water heater to a heat pump hot water heater and we'll upsize or downsize the array accordingly to take all of that into consideration. There are some significant incentives in place right now. The major incentive uh, that's been around for a while is the investment tax credit. It's called the ITC. It's worth 30% of the total system cost. So all of the parts, all of the labor, everything that's on the invoice, 30% of that will come back to you as a tax credit. It can be claimed in year one or it can be spread out over a few years. Uh, it will gradually taper off. Um, if you're filing in 2020 for 2019 installations, you're at 30%. If you're filing in 2021, I'm sorry, 2021 on near 20, 2020 installations, it will have dropped down to 26% and then it will be gone after that, unless it's extended. For now, everybody here taking part in this campaign will be able to claim the 30% inve uh, in investment tax credit. There's also renewable energy credits. So this is kind of a complicated thing and I won't go too into the details, but we could always address it in the Q&A or at our table. Um, Anybody that we're connecting to the grid with solar is a little micro power plant. And any power plant that produces power with a renewable source of energy like solar, wind, uh, hydro, biomass, um, is eligible to, they're producing renewable energy credits that the utilities use to meet their renewable portfolio standards goals. In other words, for the utility to comply with the law, a certain amount of electricity has to be coming from renewables in the grid. Every solar customer is a little renewable power plant and they get to monetize that with renewable energy credits. We always install the right type of equipment and do the paperwork for everybody um, to participate. And that usually results in a check every quarter that can vary in price, but you know, a typical uh, rooftop installation will generate about $350 a year in renewable energy credits. That's on top of the value of the electricity, on top of the tax credit, that's just another bonus. Now one of the things people really fail to understand at first blush is how you look at a site and determine if it's good for solar or not. I like to tell people solar panels are not like hostas, okay? They don't need dappled sunlight or just daylight to flourish. They need direct sun. They're like apple trees, not hostas. So uh, if you were in a house or a building where there's a lot of 150 foot tall pine trees, and yeah, it's sunny for a couple hours a day, but for the most part, those pine trees are dropping yellow pollen all over the cars. Probably it's not gonna be a good site for solar. Um, also, if you're in a house that has the slopes of the roof facing east and west, uh, as opposed to south or somewhere relatively close to south, it's also probably not the best site for solar. And to put that into perspective from a, a monetary standpoint, I guess, these houses here are pretty much perfect. You can see that the, the southern sides of the roof slopes are almost directly at the bottom of the screen. If you're looking at your house on Google Maps, north is at the top of your phone screen or on the top of the computer screen. 
If you have a slope of the roof that's facing the bottom of the screen, that's great. And if you're off by about 45 degrees to either side, that's still pretty good. A house that looks like these will produce about 40% more electricity than a house that faces east or west, assuming that all is the same with shade. So the further you get towards south, the better the productivity is. And the better the productivity means you need a solar array that's 40% smaller than somebody with an east-west roof. Or you get 40% more electricity generated and revenue generated from the array out of the same number of panels. So it's real easy to determine now that, you know, this is great. This, these roofs are perfect. They're going to need the smallest number of panels possible. There's zero shade. There's no trees there. Unfortunately for them, you know, it's pretty bland landscaping. Uh, if your house looks like that, though, it's great for solar. Sorry about the landscaping. And if your house has a lot of trees covering and east-west, you should expect that if you get a proposal from us, it's probably not going to look as good as you had hoped because we're going to be looking at that difference in production. Also, on a ground mount, we do lots of ground mounted systems. Um, we can do trackers that follow the sun. We can do fixed arrays that just sit there. Um, we're looking at is the ground relatively level? Can an excavator go over there without tipping over? Can we trench to the house without going through your septic system? Because that's generally a wrong, a good, not a good thing to do. Costs us a lot of extra money once. Um, so those are the things you want to look at. If, if, you're, if you're considering a ground array, think about if you're driving that machine, is it feasible to get from where the array would go to the house? That's what we're going to be looking at. And you know we are the experts, so when you consult with us, we're going to come out and we're going to take the shade analysis. We're going to give, get all of the measurements that we need, and we're going to tell you straight, this is great for solar, this is pretty good, I wouldn't recommend it. You'll hear from us the same type of advice that you would get if you were talking to a family member. You know, we're not going to sell something that doesn't belong there. Uh, we have to look at our work down the road and make sure that anybody else who sees our work says, oh, that's Granite State Solar, that's, that's quality. We wouldn't put panels on the north facing side of a roof and have somebody see that and say, ooh, you know, you know what I'm saying. So products that we install. So one of the nice things about this campaign, and I think another one of the reasons we might have been selected, is um, we put together the state-of-the-art products for the portfolio for this campaign. Your typical solar panel that most companies install right now is around 300 watts, uh, maybe 310 on the high end. We're using 350 watt uh, LG uh, rear conductor panels. That means that the conductors are on the back of the silicon, uh, back of the cells, so you can't see the conductors. What that means ultimately is that the workmanship warranty goes from 12 years to 25 years. The degradation over time is minimal, practically nothing. They're going to work at 25 years from now almost as good as when they're brand new. That's the warranty. And they're really high output, and that means that you don't need as many panels. If you're doing 300 watt panels, you might need, say, 20. On a typical roof, maybe we can do with 18 or 17 of these LGs. And for a lot of folks, roof space is a consideration. You don't have all the real estate in the world up there. So we wanted to bring out a really good panel that would um, help people get as close to zeroing out their electric bill as we can uh, and also provide the best longevity that we, that we can, sort of the Ferrari of solar panels, but at a really Toyota Corolla price. Um, that's what we went for. We also convert all of the power from the solar panel to house current up on the roof. Each panel has a microinverter that takes the DC output from the solar panel, converts it to 240 AC, and that inverter also works like a circuit breaker. So you're not only getting more power into your house because you're sending AC current, which has a lower line loss than DC, which is what the solar panel puts out. If, if anything goes wrong and the power is turned off to the array, everything from the panels down to your, to your main electrical panel, everything from the solar panels on the roof down to the electrical panel is de-energized. Fire departments like that, homeowners like that, it's a real safe way to install solar. Um, and on top of that, the benefits to the consumer, every panel is individually optimized and monitored. So you can literally look at your phone and look at your app, see every single panel up on the roof or on the ground, and you know for 25 years that it's working because it doesn't make noise, it doesn't squeak when something's wrong with it, right? It just sits there, magic. But your monitoring system that these microinverters make possible gives you all that information. You can also even get emails automatically if something's not right. And customers sometimes think, that's so cool, I want an email anytime the littlest thing goes wrong. 
Then in the first snowstorm, they get 30 emails, one for each panel on the roof. So <laughs> we recommend system level monitoring, not the panel level. You can always check the panels you know, on your phone. But it's nice to know you're actually getting what you paid for, and the microinverters um, really help make that possible. Snap and rack racking. So uh, panels, you can array, the array on a roof, you can love it or hate it. Um, it's a, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but we try and make all of them look as good as we can. We used rails that are black anodized aluminum. They match the panels, so you don't see any silver in between the panels or sticking out at the ends. It, uh, the, these rail, the racking system is cut flush with the edge of the array. The, the, the rails don't go past the edge of the array. So it looks nice and smooth and uniform, and it's all one color. The racking system will last you forever. It's warranted for 25 years. It's all stainless steel and aluminum. Um, the flashing system uh, also is extremely durable. It makes a, there's a physical barrier over the penetration in the roof, so it's not going to leak. It, this, the one place your roof won't leak is where these feet are, and you can see the flashing that's lapped underneath the shingles. Uh, it's extremely robust. That's like a standing seam metal roof, essentially. It's the same material, um, galvanized steel. Then there's the monitoring system. I touched on that earlier. That is a screenshot of a, um, one of the different ways you can look at the monitoring of your solar array. And that's with a, a, an item that we install called an Envoy IQ. It talks to the microinverters, and it will let you monitor the array uh, forever. On the ground racking side, there's two systems. There's, on the left, there's Nuance Energy's uh, Osprey platform. It actually bolts the array to the ground. You drill holes, you put in an earth anchor, then you pull up with a come along to about 3,000 pounds per square foot of, uh, or sorry, just 3,000 pounds of uplift. And then you slide like a Chinese finger trap down the cable and it locks it in. And it's great because you don't need an excavator to pour concrete or a concrete truck getting out to a fixed ground array like you normally would. You can install these in a lot more places. You can even uh, adjust the legs like a, like a jack on a trailer to each leg goes up and down. So you can actually make the array perfectly level even when the ground is undulating. It looks really nice. Those are rated also at 150 mile an hour wind loads and 80 pounds per square foot of snow. So it's extremely, extremely rugged. Uh, the trackers on the right, that's, uh, those are made in Vermont by All Earth Renewables. Granite State Sol Solar installs more of these trackers than any other company in the nation on the residential market. Uh, we do about 70 a year, at least. This year we're gonna blow that out of the water. We've already installed 30 or 40. Um, the trackers are really cool because they follow the sun all day from sunup to sundown. They tilt and turn, and they, so they're always perfectly aligned every day of the year, regardless of the season. And they shed snow automatically. Uh, they will actually go to the north side and dump snow. They will go flat if the winds are too high, and then they're rated to 120 miles an hour on the wind load. And the production is through the roof. Uh, a single tracker with 24 panels can make twice as much power as the average home uses in a year. So an average home uses around 8,000 kilowatt hours. I have a tracker at my house that has the, the, the panels that are almost identical to the ones for this campaign. Uh, and it'll, it'll, it's gonna do 16,000 kilowatt hours with just 24 panels, one hole in the ground, one pylon, and, uh, and it's really cool to watch them work, too, because you look away, and 10 minutes later you look back, and it's in a different position, and it's always facing the sun. And when you put a bunch of them together, they're like sunflowers. They just kind of all follow, and it's pretty cool. And they're very, very efficient. They make about 45% more power than a fixed roof array. Oh, it's dramatic. Batteries. Um, we get a lot of calls about batteries, and I'll tell you two things. Uh, I'll tell you more than two, but the two main things. Do they work? They're amazing. Yes, they work. The reliability is through the roof. Um, they don't have any maintenance requirements anymore. They will last 12 years, 12,000 cycles. And the other part, which is not so good, is they're expensive. The, the pricing for this campaign is extremely discounted, but when I show it to you, you're probably still gonna say, wow, that's a lot of money. They're kind of a luxury item. They're more expensive than a whole home backup generator, but they're, they're at the forefront of technology. The prices will come down over time. And uh, we're installing quite a few of them right now, but I would say um, they're, they're somewhat of a convenience more than a necessity in, in a way. You can, you can get home backup power with a generator and it'll work. If you're using a battery, you're paying extra for 
no noise, no fueling, no maintenance, no annual, no every week starting up, no propane costs. Ultimately, a battery could pay for itself um, over time, especially if you're self-consuming, using it every day uh, to offset something like a peak demand charge. If the utility was ever to apply peak demand charges or time of use rates, the battery can help you uh, completely avoid any of those charges. Um, and in some markets, utilities are paying customers, our, com our customers in Vermont actually, uh, will receive up to $36 by Green Mountain Power by giving access to the power in the battery to the utility. And the utility can drain it down at times of peak demand. So right now in New Hampshire, the main market for batteries is convenience for backup power in the event of a power outage. However, if something changes down the road and the utility charges time of use rates or they decide they want to compensate like Green Mountain Power does and incentivize people to get batteries to help with the grid loads, Everything that we're doing in this campaign, everything that I've talked about is completely compatible. You can add a battery whenever, and you don't have to undo anything related to the solar to add a battery now or you know, years from now. On the warranty side, uh, here, these are all of the components that are part of this campaign in the warranty listings. Our workmanship is 12 years. So like conduit runs, piping, something falling off the wall, a leaky roof, heaven forbid, Anything that would, would happen like that is a, a workmanship, and that would be covered by us for 12 years. The panels, the LG solar panels, same LG as your smartphones and maybe these TVs, though that's a sharp. Um, that LG, 25 years on the workmanship, 25 years on the production. Um, end phase inverters, 25 years. The racking on the roof, 20 years. The fixed ground mount nuance system that doesn't move, that's 25 years. And the tracker by All Earth is 10 years. At year 10 with the All Earth tracker, you do have to do maintenance, and that is change a pint of mineral oil. And that's the first and only maintenance on a tracker. It's uh, pretty tough. Then the Sonnen batteries, uh, Sonnen has a typical warranty of 10 years, 10,000 cycles. If you buy it with Granite State Solar and we install it, it's 12 years, 12,000 cycles. Granite State Solar is Sonnen's preferred contractor. We're the only solar company in the state that has that title, or any, of any kind of company. We're the only one in New Hampshire that is a preferred contractor with Sonnen, and they've vetted us. They've, we've all been factory trained, everybody, even our sales people and our receptionist who answers the phone has received factory Sonnen training, um, not to mention just, not just the installers. And um, because of that, uh, they up our warranty that we offer to our clients because they know the installation is going to be done right and that we've given the proper information to the clients that when they're making a decision, like expectations are set realistically. So that's pretty amazing for a battery to last that long. Um, and there is no such thing as solar maintenance. I just want to clear one thing up. A lot of companies will say, oh, well, if you lease it or you get a PPA, we'll do the maintenance and then you never have to worry about that. If we could sell a maintenance plan, if it was like, if there was a way that we could actually do something that was productive and add value, we would sell a maintenance plan. The only thing that you do with solar array is maybe if you have snow building up underneath the panels, you would snow blow them or, you know, on the ground or roof rake. Usually they shed the snow really fast by themselves, like a standing seam metal roof, and you don't have to rake. There's no moving parts. There's no, nothing to do. The rain washes them off. Uh, snow slides off quickly when the sun comes out after a storm. Um, so don't worry about maintenance. If it doesn't work in 25 years, it's a warranty issue and it's gonna be repaired for free. It's not a maintenance issue. Job costs. Okay, we custom quote every job. We don't do quotes over the phone. We don't do quotes over the internet like a lot of companies do because you cannot really accurately measure shade. You can't look at the roof pitch accurately from the satellite imagery. You can't look at an electrical panel. You can't measure the rafters. We have to get an engineered stamp, building permit, electrical permit, and we need to quote you accurately the first time on every job. So that's why we send out people. We don't do the hard sell at the kitchen table where you have to sign before our sales guys leave. We, we hate that. We basically gather all the information, bring it back to the office, put it into the computer model that spits out the production, and we figure everything else out, and we send you a proposal, and we show you the return on investment, and then that's it. Um, we don't do... Uh, internet quotes, and a lot of people don't like that. They think we're just trying to give them a hard sell on the kitchen table, but the really, reality is we want to do it accurately. Um, okay. This group buy model that Arden mentioned earlier, it's legit. Um, 
we basically went to our suppliers and our, manuf and our manufacturer partners like LG and Sonnen and our suppliers out of Boston that we get a lot of our materials from and said, we want to make this bid really attractive for Nashua Solarize. We want volume discounts. We want you to bring the price down because we're going to guarantee a certain amount of volume so it's justified. And by you guys all individually buying a single array, you're adding to a group buying power that allowed us to basically c contribute or guarantee a certain volume from our suppliers and literally get the price down significantly. About, um, on an average job, this pricing is $2,000 less than a typical job. And I know that on some smaller arrays that we might install here in the city, we're gonna lose money. And on some larger ones, we'll make it back. But on average, we're gonna be okay. We're not gonna put ourselves out of business and we can still give everybody a really, really good price. So if one to 19 people in Nashua sign up with us, the price is 310 a watt installed with all these top of the line components that I showed you earlier. Um, if 20 or more people, 20 to 49 people sign up, it's $3 a watt installed. And if more than 50 people sign up, it's 295 a watt installed. If you install early and the tiers haven't been met, but then the tiers are met later, we'll send a rebate check. And that was guaranteed in our RFP, it's in writing. Um, these prices are incredibly competitive. If I was to give you some context, uh, two years ago, we did our last solar up campaign for Londonderry. It was 352 a watt installed with 200 and, uh, no, that was, um, where? I think there were 270 watt panels, 352 a watt installed. So now we're at 350 watt panels, much higher energy density, and a much lower cost uh, installed out the door. And uh, I think that, like uh, Arden said earlier, you can get quotes from anybody else and we would encourage that, shop around, it's a big purchase. Um, but what you'll find that if there's anybody is at this price, it's probably with a much lower tier bundle of equipment, probably a string inverter instead of a micro, probably uh, um, a brand of panel you haven't heard of. Uh, so we think this is a good value. We think that being able to offer these high-end components that have the best warranties and the best production for you at this price uh, is, really, is really the best we could do. That battery pricing, by the way, by the way that's, so they start at $8,500. That's for 3,000 watts of battery output and four kilowatt hours of capacity. You can go all the way up to 8,000 watts and 16 kilowatt hours. Um, that price is, I said earlier, it's, it's up there, but that's actually incredibly competitive. The, the <laughs> distributor made a mistake on the quote they gave us, and I sent it in to Nashua, and it was like literally $2,000 less than it should have been. That should be 10,500, not 8,500. And when we brought it to the, then they said, oh, we made a mistake. I'm like, too late, we submitted the bid, you're gonna honor that price, and they're honoring the price. So. Literally, anybody outside of Nashua and Hudson that's going to buy batteries is going to spend quite a bit more money than any of you. Um, cost adders. So again, more transparency. We're going to tell you when we come out to your house. If we need to dig a trench for a roof array, normally you don't dig a trench with a roof system. Uh, we're going to charge for that. Um, if the system is so large that the utility is going to charge us for a supplemental review because they might need to upgrade a transformer, we're going to charge for that. Um, if we're going to have to relocate your roof vent pipe, we don't cut them and cover them. You can't do that legally by code. It's not, not allowed. We have to move the vent pipe to the other side of the house or something. We have to pay a plumber for that, and he charges us 700 bucks. So these are the adders. And um, it's uncommon, really. It's maybe 5% maybe of jobs have any sort of adder on them. But when we come out and do a site visit with you, you're going to know about this before uh, we leave. It won't be a surprise. It'll never be an after-the-fact type of thing. And we'd be happy to leave you with all of this pricing. It's actually at the desk out here as well. If you want to see that when somebody comes out to visit with you, that the price that they send you in the email quote matches this, um, I guarantee you it will. Financing. Uh, a lot of our clients elect to finance because uh, not everybody has 10 or 20 or $30,000 kicking around. Uh, I know I don't. Um, we work with Vermont State Employees Credit Union. Financing is at 3.99% fixed, and there's no early payment penalty. There's no collateral. It's a personal loan, no, not tied to the house or a car. It's uh, a good deal. And the, even though they're in Vermont and we're here, you're all eligible because we, um, we buy our customers a membership with the New England Sustainable Energy Association, and that makes 
our customers eligible to use Vermont State Employees Credit Union financing. And so here's a, you know, underneath that is a sample price. I don't want to go through all of those line item by line item because Mike is going to be short on time if I do. Um, so I'm going to skip along. But this is uh, available if anybody would like a copy of it. Um, it, it this will be, uh, I think this show, or this filming will be uh, on, available on National Public Television. And we can also provide um, um, more of these examples in real, real life if somebody wants to follow up. Okay, so the, this campaign, we're collecting most of the uh, interest through the website for the campaign, which is right here. It's nashuasolarize.com. You can put in your name and address and select if you're interested in solar or weatherization or both, and then we'll contact you. If you want to learn more about us, you can also visit our website or just Google Granite State Solar, and there's reviews out there. Um, I promise it's not like my wife and my friends and family. They're real customers um, and legit, so you can search us. And with that, I will turn things over to Mike, so thank you. How's it going? Uh, again, my name is Mike Turcott. I'm the owner of Turn Cycle Solutions. We're a Nashua-based company, um, but I'm the plus in the Solarize Plus campaign. So a lot of uh, Solarize campaigns are kind of focused just on the solar component. Um, what we do, what weatherization is, is going in and looking at a property and finding the inefficiencies that are uh, what we call the low-hanging fruit: insulation, poor lighting, heating problems, etc. So. Our, our goal is to lower the energy in the home, create a more comfortable environment, um, have an expedited return of investment, and then try to couple it with the solar system. Excuse me for just a moment. So who are we? We're uh, a pretty young firm. We've been in business for about 10 years. Um, we, we work ex very uh, exclusively with the New Hampshire SAVES program. Um, so I'm gonna talk just about that a little bit later on. Um, we're what is an energy audit. We'll talk about some uh, technical equipment that we use on uh, and in your home when we do an energy audit. And then what are some best practices? And then I'll give you some uh, time to ask me questions at the end and I'll ask Eric to come up. So who are we? We're eight full-time employees, plus or minus. We range in age from like 22 to 40-ish. Uh, we're based right here in Nashua. Uh, we're right around the corner on Otterson Street. Um, all of my guys uh, are Building Performance Institute certified. So basically what that means is that there's a, a certificate that as a, an energy auditor um, that you have to acquire to be able to appropriately be able to inspect a home. Um, there's a criteria of best practices on how you properly air seal a home, etc. cetera. Um, we also have an EPA certified uh, renovator on our staff. Um, so if we ever have to take off any lead siding or anything like that, we have the appropriate um, people on staff to do that. We've won some pretty cool awards. So in 2012, I uh, was voted Young Entrepreneur of the Year from the Small Business Administration in New Hampshire. 2016, um, I won a Cornerstone Award. Um, I'm currently the president of the Home Builders Association for Nashville, Manchester, and Concord Local. Um, so we're busy people. Um, we're not just business owners. We're active participants in our community, and I pride myself on that. Um, any of these three items? Ring a bell for you, high utility costs, comfort issues, costly repairs due to ice dams. Um, this is where weatherization kind of comes into play. Um, why are these problems happening? In a nutshell, it's inadequate insulation, just to boil it down. So this is our process. We inspect a home, we go back, we strategize, try to come up with a solution, um, and then we create an actual implementation schedule, and then we monitor and make sure that those uh, things are taken care of. So as a, as a part of this process, um, I'm going to kind of double talk throughout this, um, and I, I ask you just to bear with me. So whereas we are a preferred vendor for uh, New Hampshire Saves, New Hampshire Saves is um, a rate payer um, rebate program. So if on your electric bill, there's a little you know, extra finance charge, one of the like three or four on the side. There's a pool of money, and these are the local utilities, um, and they provide rebates for us. So what we do is we go in, we inspect your home, we uh, use a piece of equipment called a blower door and a thermal imaging camera. That's when I was like 23, I look much better then than now. Um, but we're looking at these things. So we're looking to find out where those penetrations are coming through your attic, how they're ent entering in in the basement. Um, and, and our guys, and myself included, we're trying to find ways to seal that from happening, right? So it's essentially the, the terminology, excuse me, 
uh, the terminology I use is like you having a winter hat and punching a bunch of holes in the top of it, okay? So if you go up in an attic, you have a plumber who's drilled a three inch hole for a one inch pipe. He's drilled a one inch hole for a little quarter inch wire. And so you can imagine the, it degrades the integrity of that hat. Furthermore, if you have an attic catch that's uninsulated, it's like you cutting a two by two square on the top of your head and just throwing it on the ground. So in the end, it's really imperative um, that we inspect the entire attic. Um, we don't do kind of visual inspections from the street and look at your electric bills. Like we go into that nasty crawl space, the knee wall where all your luggage is. We crawl through that basement space to try to find where these spaces are and then create the appropriate action. So there's stack effect in your house. And basically what happens is hot goes to cold, cold goes to hot. You're very familiar with this. Second floor in a cape is always 10 times hotter than the basement. Everyone agree? So what we're trying to do is stop that from happening. So we want to eliminate the cold air from coming in at the bottom, excuse me, and we want to stop it at the top, and vice versa in the opposing season. Just kind of weird little thing. So cobwebs are they're a real big indicator for an energy auditor. Uh, we look at that as like a clear indication without even taking any testing equipment. If we see cobwebs, we know that there's a clear sign of air leakage happening. Spider webs are always uh, an indication of a pressure differential from outside to inside. Spiders are always going to build a web wherever there's food, right? So if they know that a fly is going to fly through that space, we in turn know that there's air leakage happening. So we'll address that in this situation. Some equipment we use. So the equipment on the left is a blower door. So basically what we do is we create, a, we put a big fan in your front door, we close all the windows in the house, we shut the heating system down, make sure that your fireplace isn't running, and we fire up this uh, piece of equipment. The fan basically puts your house under negative pressure. So if you can imagine um, it putting pressure on the inside, and then what we do is we walk around and try to inspect to determine where the actual leaks are coming in and create a pragmatic work scope to eliminate those. On the right, I'm sure you've seen this on ghost hunters. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so this is a thermal imaging camera. Uh, as, a, as a tool, we kind of use these two together. So in the top kind of images there, uh, we're, we're showing air leakage. So what happens is we get that fan cranked up and basically we'll walk around with the thermal imaging camera if applicable. And the fanning that you'll see around that window is a poor window installation. So it's not the window that's the problem, it was the installation of the window that was actually the, the part. And then you'll see in that bottom right hand picture that there was a cathedral wall in a, in a master bedroom that where they just never installed any insulation. Um, in this particular picture, we're looking at weird situations like why is the, the snow melting just off the center part of that roof in the middle of that space? So a typical cape, there's a, there's a set of stairs that go up the, the front of the house right there and come to find out the insulator was a little too big, couldn't get in the space and decided not to insulate it. So what happened is, is in this particular instance, the, the snow was melting off, it was creating ice in the walkway and someone actually got injured due to the fact that the snow was melting off the roof. So he was pretty motivated to get that fixed. So you can see in the thermal imaging camera on the left where uh, there's a heat differential, and then on the right, it can, I mean, it's as clear as day, you didn't even need a piece of equipment. So we're creating and kind of looking at these types of things. I'm gonna burn through a couple of these. So when you look at an attic, the best day for an energy auditor or an energy installer or whatever is on a day that it lightly snows. So a dusting on a roof is like, uh, it's, it's the ultimate condition for us to determine how a house is performing because we can see how uh, something is insulated. So I'm just showing you some uh, roof systems. Um, obviously you're very familiar with ice damming. The reason why you have ice dams is not due to a roofing problem. And the way to resolve ice dams is not by getting a new roof. So the reason why you have ice dams is you have heat and moisture penetrating through the attic deck. It then goes up to the actual roof sheathing. It heats up the roof deck and then in turns creates melting. As it goes out to that over edge, what we call the soffit, it then starts to freeze and then you have this um, hot and cold, hot and cold, and it starts to create ice damming, in turn penetrating the roof and creating costly damage for yourself. So at that point, once we've figured out all your problems, um, you can lay on the couch, we'll listen to you tell, tell us all about your problems, and then we'll create kind of a work scope. So through uh, the New Hampshire Saves program, just specifically speaking that, uh, the rebate program, we actually line item out every single item. 
So you, when our uh, sales guys come out or myself come to um, actually look at and kind of sit down with you to go pragmatically over your work scope, we provide you line by line cost. And then on the far right here, the second to last column, excuse me, you'll see the appropriate um, uh, cost payback basically. And then in this particular case, this was a $10,715 job, which is a pretty good sized job. I would say average homeowner, uh, it spends maybe four to $6,000 with us, and then up to 50% of it, if you're qualified through the New Hampshire Saves Program, um, they cover 50% of it. So the math in this equation is a little different than that. Uh, this is a higher job, uh, but I figured it was appropriate to kind of show you. So $10,715, the utility company covered $4,000, leaving a remaining copay to the customer of $6,615.74. Um, I can talk more about this later, just like how this program works, how to get qualified, but I'll keep moving for a moment. Um, some insulation factors, people ask me questions all the time. What's the best insulation? What's the worst insulation? It, it doesn't apply. It's, how can you appropriately insulate the home under the condition that it's in? If it's ideal situation, it's a new construction house, that's one answer. If it's a retrofit application, it's a completely different application. So by that certificate that our guys have, they've been appropriately trained to recognize and diagnose what the appropriate um, ways to insulate your homes are. So once you agree to moving forward and you say, yeah, I love this process, I can't wait to be more comfortable, save some money, uh, we move to the implementation period. Um, so in this ap application here, what we're showing you uh, essentially is it's is a dense pack um, job where we actually drilled in through some drywall, installed some cellulose into um, a valley of a roof that had habitual ice damming problems and showed heat loss all the time. The image on the right is uh, mesh in dense pack. So if you have an e-wall cavity that you want to keep as conditioned space and keep that luggage and stuff out there, this would be the appropriate application. This is the part of, that differentiates us from a lot of other insulators in the world. Um, our guys literally go through your entire attic and pull back all that old fiberglass, the rat, mouse, squirrel grossness up there, and they'll actually peel back. And so what I've shown you in this image here is that they've gone along every one of the top plates on that interior partition and take, taken foam around uh, the top plates, the light fixtures, and now we're closing up that hat and making it more efficient. So on the left here, you see an attic that was very poorly insulated. Um, that's like a 12 inch trunk line that goes down the middle. Uh, we like to see like 16 plus inches. So on this image here, you can see we made a huge impact. Uh, when, we, when our installers get up there, this was in the middle of winter a couple of years ago, and uh, it was like Brazil. It was so hot in this attic. Um, and then by the time we were done, we ran, went around and sealed up a lot of this duct work, and then also uh, blew it, since, uh, insulation over the top of it. It was the appropriate temperature outside. You want to have your attic as close to the outside temperature as possible. Within 10 degrees is the appropriate uh, temperature that you'd be looking for. Just some other insulation measures that we've done throughout. Um, knee wall spaces are really, really big problematic area um, because they don't get treated as outside walls. So essentially when it can be in a new colonial house or it can be in a cape, it can be in any style of house. But in the left hand image I'm showing you here is you can see that the insulation has kind of been pushed towards that wall plate. And the reason being is the wind is actually blowing the insulation towards that space. So then we're having insulation pockets um, of deficiencies. In addition to that, that wall has no air barrier. So as the wind gets blown in against that space, it's driving right into the cavity, and that's why those bedrooms are so freezing cold on the second floor in many cases. Um, is, spray foam is applicable in some applications. Uh, this is a spray foam job that we did during a renovation project. Um, we scraped the studs, prepped it for drywall. Um, typically, just to give a reference, uh, spray foam is the highest R value per inch but it is also the highest cost of installation as well too. So bearing that in mind, we kind of look at what the most appropriate cost is for that specific install and then, and then call it due. Uh, we take a lot of attention to detail. So like I live in a house and I don't like my stuff wrecked. So, you know, in this particular case, this gentleman lived alone. He didn't have really you know, too many people in the area. We actually helped him to move all his personal belongings to the center of the room 
and then we wrapped everything in plastic, taped everything to ensure that when the spray foam installation, as you'll see on the right hand side, took place, none of his personal belongings were damaged or harmed in any way. Unfortunately, when spray foam is installed and many installations, as you know, it's a dirty job. Um, our guys take real pride. Um, our installers set drop cloths up when they come into the house. Um, if it's a rainy day, you know, they'll kind of wrap the cords uh, as they come into the house and so we're not dragging things across your house. Um, it's probably my biggest sticking point. If you ever hear me scream, it's probably because someone didn't put a drop cloth down or didn't vacuum appropriately or dust something. So um, I apologize if you ever do hear me yelling. That's probably why. So uh, just even in an attic space, like we sprayed spray foam in this attic, there was some raw storage in the space, but we polyed everything to make sure that as, your, as the homeowner put their personal belongings back into this attic, they wouldn't have you know, residue and things like that on the ground. We actually physically scraped it after the fact too. Some other quick inefficiencies. So distribution loss in your home is also probably one of the highest. I mean, you can see up to 20 or 30% loss in heating. So uh, those little stringers that get attached to a trunk line, they're not appropriately taped or sealed. Uh, we have a piece of equipment that we can actually hook up to a, our furnace and we can actually tell you how leaky it is. In fact, uh, the 2013 building code requires every new construction home built, um, as long as the town or city has adopted that building code, um, you actually have to have the house tested with that piece of uh, equipment. So what happens is we test the ductwork, make sure it meets a certain criteria, and then we also run the blower door test to ensure that the house is airtight as well too. So as a consumer, the market is moving that way, but unfortunately we have millions and millions of homes that aren't in that bubble. So we have the appropriate ways to test those. Just some quick other things. So. As, as probably many of you have in your home, and, and Eric, one of my sales guys, will kind of fight me on this all the time, say the world has moved to LEDs already, Mike. There's not that many bulbs out there to replace. So in, in line with Eric's kind of thought, I, I hope that you have tr converted to LEDs, um, but I want to give you some kind of food for thought too. So if you own a commercial building um, and you have a lighting upgrade done, so you go from incandescent bulbs to an LED bulb, you're going to notice a large heating increase in your bill because the incandescent bulb is 90% heat and 10% light. So as you touch a bulb, as everyone has, and toasted their fingertips right off their hands, um, that's the reason why. So as we, in a big municipality building or in a warehouse, as you make those conversions, we really take into account that, hey, we may be lowering the electric bill, but on the flip side, we may be increasing the heating cost as well slightly. So is there, is there a greater impact plus or minus? Um, but on an LED light bulb, it's 93% light uh, and then about 3% heat. So they still do produce some heat, but they're a lot more tolerable. Closing out the project, so at the completion of all of our jobs. So you've gone from energy audit, you've signed a contract, we go out, we source the rebates, the customer doesn't have to do that, we take that burden on. Um, in the end, our installers do the work, and then after a completion of work, we actually run diagnostic testing again to make sure that the work that we said we were going to do is at that standard or higher. Um, so it's actually really great because the New Hampshire program, uh, New Hampshire Saves program, provides a, a quality assurance check. So every 10% uh, of all my work that we produce within this program, they actually come out and a third party inspects our work. So it keeps us on bar. We make sure that we're invoicing appropriately because in the end, it's your ratepayer dollars that are, are keeping that in check. So it's imperative. It keeps us honest. We like it. Um, I'm going to burn through this one really quickly. So this is a milliard project. If you have a commercial space that you're considering having weatherization done to, um, basically we kind of mapped out what the opportunities were for this program. So the Milliard Technology Park right uh, off the Broad Street Parkway, as many of you have probably driven by it millions of times, uh, Arthur Spilios and his family own that building. Um, and basically we kind of road mapped what the potential opportunities were for this building uh, a couple of years ago. Um, this is just like a little add-on thing that we could show um, to you, your occupants. So if you have a big space and you want to show tracking of usage or what your proposal is for the future with your energy package, this is just a little kind of diagram thing that we created. So they have started the process a couple of years ago and we did some spray foam on this loading dock um, to try to uh, alleviate some of the, um, the, <laughs> the cold issues. So there, there are guys back up to this ramp 
basically all these things that are all covered are all these tracks that all the clothes of the uniforms slide across. So this door is open at six o'clock in the morning, it's busier than a B, 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 and then the doors close and they're closed until the end of the day. So they had a drastic key problem or a transfer during that time, so we worked with them to try to insulate that shell so when it started to come back up to temperature, it didn't take as long. Um, we did uh, some LED lighting swap. It's not great pictures at the quality on the TV. Um, but on the left-hand side, we did some LED uh, lighting post upgrades. On the left, it, it creates kind of an ambiance too. So like the one on the left was kind of like a security issue. It was kind of dark. You couldn't really see that well. But by going to LED, it brightened up the space, made it look a little bit more uh, incentivized at night too. All right, pricing. So. Uh, Eric and I have kind of like similar pricing models. They're very different products. So uh, whether you want to go with solar and or um, the uh, whether you want to go with solar or the um, weatherization program. I'm sorry, I flipped ahead. So for 10 customers, one to 10 customers, it's 3% off whatever your total bill is, uh, 11 to 12, and then up to 33 customers or more, you'll get 10% off your bill. Um, the caveat that I will tell you with this is if you get into the New Hampshire Saves program, which I'll talk about now, you're eligible for up to $4,000 in rebates. Here's the deal though, you cannot double dip. So in our RFP that we signed uh, through the New Hampshire Saves con uh, program, we're not eligible to deviate from what their offers are. Um, whether we won the bid or one of our competitors won the bid, this is the, the case. So what happens is, is how do you get qualified for New Hampshire saves? I keep talking about it. So you give us your square footage of your home, and then you also give us the uh, fuel usage that you use annually. So from January to January, or whatever the case is, and that's how you get qualified into the program. Now for multifamily uh, properties, condos, there's a varying of um, insulation uh, rebates and electrical rebates. Um, I need to know very specific information to kind of provide that, but at a higher arching uh, term, it's 50% um, for a lot of the items. What's eligible? Um, so insulation, attic, basements, crawl space, garage ceilings, uh, air ceiling, heating, cooling, duct ceiling, pipes. Um, it, there's uh, also financing that can be coupled with this in addition to, so this is uh, just kind of one of the programs, there's a 2% there's a financing program that kind of goes in line with this. Um, different utilities offer different packages, so essentially what happens is, is they'll actually, we'll come out, we'll give you that kind of cost breakout, and you decide you want to go forward with the whole scope. Um, you go and you fill out the, the package um, with the bank, and then they, you get a 5% interest rate on a personal loan. Well, what the utility uh, company does is they actually buy down that rate to 2%. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it kind of specifies like kind of determining what um, the cost of the project is. So say if you had a $4,000 project, it would be about four years um, that they'd provide you a loan package for. Um, remember two things. Um, there's highly discounted uh, incentives available that we can qualify you for, for your home or building. And if you want to save money and retain comfort, I'm here for you in any way that I can be. Uh, my name is Mike Turcott again. I'm the owner of Turn Cycle Solutions. My staff is out in the hallway if we can help you in any way. And let's do some questions. Eric, you want to come up too? You just want to sit from here? How do you guys want to do it? I'll just put it here. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. All right, everybody. Thank you for your patience. So how this will work, uh, it might seem a little strange, but we do have uh, people watching from home. Uh, so when you ask a question, we're just going to repeat the question uh, because we have the microphones and people at home can actually um, hear us through the mics. Um, so what we'll do is if you just want to raise your hand, um, it can be a weatherization question or a solar PV question and we'd be happy to answer them. Are we, were, were we that good in our presentations? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the question was for a roof system, what's the wind rating and the snow rating? Uh, so we need um, you need to actually uh, allow for at least 60 PSS, PSF of uplift, and that varies with the installation. For, for example, if the, if the array is down a foot from the ridge, 
It's going to be very little or no uplift. If the array is built up right at the ridge and even over it by a few inches, that can create an uplift issue. Um, snow loads, uh, they may vary by town, but what we're doing with each system is getting to 70 to 80 PSF on the snow side. Uh, current building code, essentially, with the addition of 2.3 pounds per square feet of the solar panels. So when we do a building permit, we have to get a, a PE stamp, an engineered stamp, that those rafters will handle the snow load and the existing weight of the roof, how many layers of shingles, et cetera, and the weight of the racking and the weight of the panels. Uh, and the design layout is one of those considerations. If you, if you have um, long span rafters and you're doing three by and portrait, you're putting all the weight on those narrow span of rafters. Sometimes you might have to actually design for two and portrait wider to spread the load among more rafters. And when we install the feet, we stagger which rafters we're attaching the feet to as well so that the load is varied and not like in a straight line up on a single rafter. Um, so ultimately when we do the building permit, we have to answer those questions with the code inspector and um, make sure that everything, when it, its final inspection comes, that they sign off on it, that it's done according to the plan that we submitted. So it should last forever. Good question. Yes. So that's a good question, and the question was, what's going to happen when the investment tax credit is gone, and what's going to happen with the price of installation of solar when there is no tax credit? Um, historically, the price of solar has gone down every single year for perhaps forever, um, since 1970s when solar became a thing that you could buy for your home or your off-grid camp or whatever. Um, we've seen dramatic increases, uh, I'm sorry, in, yeah, increases in efficiency and decreases in price. Um, not like a computer like Moore's Law where every six months processor speeds double. It's more linear with solar. Um, uh, I would say in 2015, we were installing for $4.20 a watt. $3.90 was like, wow. Now we're at $3 a watt with panels that instead of 260 watts being the norm, they're 350, 360 in that range. So by the time the ITC is gone, the investment tax credit is gone. We will have already been planning for this. Um, we were actually planning for tariffs. It's a similar scenario. We have tariffs right now uh, on solar panels that are imported. It affects these panels um, because they're made in South Korea, LG. Uh, it affects Chinese panels. It affects everything. It affects American companies like SunPower who make their panels in Mexico. Um, we're all in tariff world, and we knew this was coming. So literally, I was talking to LG a year ago, like, what are we going to do? We need a special pricing. We need to get it down. We pay less now, even with tariffs, than we did a year ago without tariffs. Um, so the manufacturers want to stay in business. We want to stay in business. Uh, there's definitely you know, a significant um, production worldwide manufacturing uh, capacity that's, that's cranking out solar panels right now. Um, they're going to want to stay, keep going. Uh, everybody's, I think, focused on getting costs down and continuously down so that without the investment tax credit, everything stands on its own. Um, we don't have state subsidies anymore, and we still stand on our own. Um, solar is producing power competitive with um, other sources, uh, many other sources. Solar power is cheaper than coal right now, um, and it's not quite where natural gas is, but I think it's going to be there. And so even if, if that's the case, without tax credits, if we're producing power that's on par with other uh, abundant sources, then there shouldn't be any issue with making a return on investment case. And I want to stay in business, so we'll definitely be working with the manufacturers well in advance of the expiration of the ITC. And, and it, it could be extended, too. It was extended in 2016 um, to this 2021 deadline. And maybe that would happen again. It kind of depends on the uh, political will at that time. So. Mm. I have a mic here. So just to tag on to something, because some people in the room may be processing this. Uh, I hear from people sometimes, well, I'm not going solar because I'm waiting for the technology to get better. 
Uh, and I can certainly understand that. I think I feel that way whenever I buy a computer, like I should have waited. Uh, so, but, but let me tell you this. Uh, Granite State Solar panels, the LG panels, uh, are warranted for 25 years. Uh, so how much money are you losing while you're waiting? Uh, because potentially, going solar, you could wipe out your electric bill and get basically free electricity for the next 25 years. So if you're waiting for that, you're losing money as well. Uh, so that's just another perspective uh, for anybody that has that concern. I'll add one little thing to that and then grab your next question. Um, cell phones get obsolete because your app, iPhone will not run the new apps because the processor doesn't keep up. And so it does not serve the need that you initially purchased it for and you want to replace that phone. Solar panels, when we're designing them to meet 100% of your usage, if your usage is the same of electricity consumption, it's doing the job, it's meeting 100% of your needs now and 25 years from now, there's no obsolescence. So it's different type of purchase than like a commodity like a cell phone. Question back here. Yeah. So even though solar panels would be true solar city, would we be able to add a ground array or more on the roof through you, or would that be cost complications on the extra junction of the So that's an interesting question. You have an existing roof array from Solar City and you want to know if you can add on to solar on your property. If we're doing a ground array, uh, and we're not touching the solar city equipment, absolutely, we could totally do that. If we're doing a roof array, it's going to be 100% separate, as in we cannot connect to anything that's solar cities because they own all of that. And we had this conversation with Sunrun recently, actually, and they said, don't touch it. So um, we would have a separate monitoring system for you, then a separate inverter, separate everything. If it was a ground array, that's probably completely feasible. If you have a, if you are using more power than, than you're getting produced from, from your solar city array, then you might want to look at that. If it's a roof system and you're only talking three or four more panels that can fit up there, it's probably not good economies of scale um, and it probably wouldn't be worth your while. But for something on the ground like 12 or more panels, then uh, we would be definitely willing to talk to you. Yes. So the question was, do both of our companies offer fully free estimates and evaluations? Absolutely, yeah. And so if you're, uh, yes, if you're going to be not qualified for New Hampshire saves, as a part of the New Hampshire saves, they do require us to charge a $100 energy audit fee. Should you move forward with any of the work that's proposed, whether it be small, big, or something in between, that money is then rebated back to you. So initially, in the end, you may have to outlay $100. Now that's just to cover the cost of us coming out to the site, running all the, the inspection, and then putting it into the computer, modeling software, so on. Um, but should you move forward, then we fully rebate that. Outside of the program, yes, it's 100% free. Yes, absolutely. So it's a full energy audit inspection. Uh, just, uh, I don't think I mentioned this before. So on an energy audit, uh, when uh, one of our auditors come out to the house, it's typically about an hour and a half um, from start to finish. We send kind of a preparatory email, like take the, you know, the Christmas decorations out of the closet so that we can get in the attic to take a look. Um, we ask you to kind of make way into the basement so we can look at all those things. So on average, it's about an hour and a half, plus or minus. Um, but if you were just do a visual inspection of the home without any diagnostic uh, equipment, it's probably about a half an hour, roughly. Roughly. Yes. I got um, two questions. One is the August thirty first deadline, is that for the work to be completed or mm -hmm. sign the contract for the work to be done? Um, the question is re regarding the uh, I'm not oh, I'll let you answer on your section as well. Um, by the end of the campaign, August thirty first to qualify for the campaign, we have to have a contract. And our goal is to install every system by the end of the year, because most people want to claim the tax credit ASAP. Same applies for us. And the second question is, can you speak to how, what you have to do with the city so that your property taxes don't go up? Sure, that's a great question. So, <laughs> uh, so the question is, uh, what do I need to do for the city for the property taxes to not go up? Uh, the nice thing is, is that the city of Nashua has already decided that um, solar installations, uh, they will add value to the property 
uh, but you will not have the property tax on that investment taxed, basically. So the um, you could, to put it in simpler terms, I, your house uh, market price just went up, but you don't have to pay the property tax for that. Uh, as far as the logistical process goes on that, just contact the, um, uh, I, I forget the, assessor. the assessor's office, thank you so much, the assessor's office to let them know. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it's, a very, it's a great thing, so tax-free. And I'll check with um, the assessor's office in Nashua. We just began this campaign, but we, what we did in Londonderry, they have, a sim they have a similar exemption. They have a form that the homeowner has to fill out. And with our final walkthrough where we care and feeding of your solar array, that conversation, we give you the paperwork to um, complete that form and send it into the town. So if it's a single form here, we'll do the same process. Yes. How are So the question is, um, can we figure out how much electricity you're using, how much you might be able to bank, and what you might be able to monetize in terms of extra power? Um, I guess a little bit about how do we do that. Uh, so yes, we, we, we actually look at your electric bill. We look at the entire last 12 months worth of usage. There's 13 months on the bill, but we calculate your annual usage with the last 12 months, and that's sort of our 100% baseline target. If we can hit 100% of your usage, that's great. But um, we actually want to design oftentimes for about 110% of usage because you're going to self-consume some of the electricity at full retail value because you're not importing anything. You're, you're offsetting every line item on the bill. And sometimes you're exporting extra and you're getting compensated for that net metered credit. And if you develop a surplus there, that can be monetized at the value of the supply plus the transmission plus 25% of the distribution charges. And, and we, we calculate exactly what that is and it varies a little bit depending on the, the rates that day um, or that quarter. And then when we provided the proposal, it specifically says at current electric rates, here's your return on investment time frame. We calculate that based on the value of electricity today. We do not project an escalated rate in the future. Most solar companies will say the electric rates are gonna go up 3% every year and it makes their ROI look even better. We just calculate current prices. So if rates go up, your ROI would be even shorter. If rates went down, then your ROI would take longer. But we don't try to see the future. We just look at real current value, and um, we estimate conservatively. And the shade analysis, the roof pitch, the azimuth, your GPS coordinates, our weather history, those are all the items that factor into the production number that we quote you. So, um, and we've done, we do uh, spot checks all the time on historical installations to make sure we're accurate. And we have system D rate factors, the actual specs on the actual equipment. You know, it's really um, pretty scientifically developed. And we're, we don't guarantee production because weather is a factor, but you'll be within 2% plus or minus every year even with weather changes. And there was another question here. So the question is what about the quality or the, the roof situation? How do we handle roof maintenance? So uh, first of all, before we install solar, we're going to make sure the roof is in good condition. If it's needed replacement soon, if you would be replacing that roof within five years, we wouldn't be able to install on it because our boots will damage it. It'll already be brittle and, and we'll have to say that needs to be done first. If the roof looks great, if it looks soft and pliable, the shingles, if it's an asphalt shingle roof, are not curled and they're going to last at least 10 or more years and we can install without our boots doing any damage, then great. The roof shingles underneath the solar array do not age once we put on the panels because there's no more UV hitting them. If you were to have to remove the array to replace the roof, then it's about a thousand bucks worth of labor for us to come out and do an R&R. &R. Um, you don't have to do any more rewiring. It's pretty easy to rip off the panels. It takes like an hour. I mean, you can very quickly disassemble an array. And then when we go out to reinstall, we'd have to find the rafters again. But it's economically feasible. It added a thousand dollars to the cost of the roof. And you might even just be able to take off our outside rows and lap in new shingles and then replace the panels and not have to do everything underneath it because, like I said, they, they really won't age. 
Yes. So the question is, um, what about if they need to be relocated because of an addition or a dormer or something? What's the fee? Um, we would just quote it based on time. Um, we basically charge 100 bucks an hour plus 100 bucks for a truck roll. And how many guys is it going to take? We'll calculate the man hours. Um, it seems like a lot, and maybe it is for compared to like a, what you pay a roofer. But our guys are all electricians, and they have to be electricians to handle these equipments. Even the racking system is eventually going to be part of the grounded array. You can't even have just a general laborer handle that. So it's highly skilled labor, but it's still um, it's pretty reasonable. You're not talking about buying the equipment or all the electrical systems having to be redone, just the roof and. Any other questions? There must be one or two. I see two. Uh, let's go with you, and then we'll, mm -hmm. then we'll hit you. Yes? The question is, what about on the ground trackers and the uh, maintenance schedule, the interval? Uh, you do zero maintenance or anything to the tracker for 10 years. Uh, and then at year 10, you change the mineral oil, which is the hydraulic fluid, essentially. It's a high-grade mineral, mineral oil that works at very low temperatures. And uh, it's, you change it at year 10, and then again at year 15, then again at year 20, et cetera. And it's literally, um, there's a little tank on the outside, and it's, a, about a, it's about a quart, maybe a little less than a quart of mineral oil. The, uh, the, the motors are hydraulic. There's no electric brushes. They're self-lubricating. Um, there's nothing to do. It doesn't create any friction or heat as it moves because it's very slow. So uh, they're really robust. And they were actually designed and built in Vermont. There's about 5,000 of them installed throughout New England. Um, and they were designed for our environment, so in our snow and our wind. So we love them. If we thought there was going to be a, a maintenance concern with them, we probably wouldn't install them because we don't want to have to hire a crew just for maintenance. And that, that's not making any money. You know, they're reliable. So this is a complex question. It's the, like, what's the difference between a string inverter and a micro-inverter? Micro-inverter does the in inversion right at the solar panel. And a string inverter does aggregate the strings together um, to convert to AC wherever that uh, string inverter is. Um, we do occasionally install string inverters. We use them with high power trackers with optimizers. And the optimizer does the, a similar job as a micro-inverter where it connects to the panel. It, each one is individually monitored and optimized, and they're wired in parallel. So here's a better example. Two string Christmas lights, you take out one bulb, the whole string goes down. A string inverter, your traditional older style just system design, um, without optimizers or microinverters, just a string inverter, if you have one panel shaded, that panel goes to infinite resistance, and it's like pulling out a bulb. The whole array will go down, or everything on that string, which could be a whole array. Then with a microinverter or optimizers, when you wire in parallel, it's like three wire Christmas lights. They're all in parallel. You can pull one out by shading it, and everything else works fine. So whether it's a string inverter or, or um, microinverter, we're, we're using optimizers so you get the benefit of the individual panel optimization. And, uh, but with micros, you are converting right there, whereas even with an optimizer and a string inverter, you're converting at the string inverter, and you do end up with a little bit more line loss. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Trackers can only be installed on the ground. Um, they weigh about 6,000 pounds, maybe 5,000 pounds, including like the base. And so you can't put that on a roof. I think the, the wind loads might in the, yeah, it might not work. <laughs> Um, yes. So it like a of a um, 
12 would be about the smallest size that I think would be feasible. Maybe, maybe you could do 10 panels. Um, the footprint would be about 20 feet long from end to end and about uh, 10, f 8 feet from front to back, including the tilt. So it would be a 35 degree tilt and about 10 feet if you were to drop a plumb line in the front and back. So relatively small for 10 or 12 panels. To help you with the math, uh, your typical solar panel is about 40 inches wide. So if you're going with 12 on the ground, that's going to be six panels wide. Six panels times 40 inches, there's your, your footprint. Are presentations available online? Uh, the question is, are the presentations available online? Uh, at this point, I don't think they're posted. Um, but I'm not sure, we can check with Madeline, who's our volunteer in the city, to see if they're going to be, they will be made available. I've just been informed by a smart person in the back of the room. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? It's uh, 7.20. We're, I think, scheduled to 7.30. Mm -hmm. We can answer them here. We also have the folks out at the tables with site review sheets. If you'd like to put your name down, we will contact you to schedule an evaluation. Do you have similar forms? Yeah, I'll be able to answer any questions specifically about your home. I know that it's we kind of talk in vague terms uh, due to the qualifications that take place, uh, but it's very simple. I just need a name. Oh, I'm sorry. I just need a name, an address, a square footage, and then we can contact you for fuel usage down the road to find out if you'll get qualified. And then either or, we can schedule a site evaluation for uh, through the um, Solarize Plus campaign or through New Hampshire Saves. Go ahead. Sure. The question is about the science of the orientation of the home for what makes a good solar candidate versus not so good. <clears throat> um, the sun delivers photons, which knock electrons out of the silicon, and that's what gets conducted by the conductors to turn into electricity. The, the number of photons that enter the silicon is really related to what kind of an angle they're at, and a, a perfectly perpendicular angle you get the maximum absorption of all those photons by the silicon cell. When you're on an acute angle, a lot more of that light is reflected and refracted, and it doesn't end up in the, the silicon wafer. Um, so that's, a, that's the whole thing with the angle. Perpendicular to the sun is perfect. Solar panels are measured under standard test conditions. It's called STC. If you look up a spec sheet on a panel, it says STC. STC is 1,000 watts of irradiance, which means 1,000 watts of sunlight is hitting the ground right there about 72 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and uh, th that's it. So, and, and oh, perpendicular, perfectly perpendicular. The light is literally right above the panel. So to achieve those standard test conditions, you have to hold that panel perfect. And if you look at a typical roof, it's not usually perfect. It's very rare that the panel actually is putting out its rated output. But when you put them on a tracker, um, they'll actually exceed their rated outputs. Um, my tracker in my house, uh, is rated 8,650 watts, and I've seen 9,500 watts um, many, many days this spring when you have cobalt blue sky, at least 1,000 watts of irradiance, but lower than 72 degrees, really cold weather. You get better conductivity out of the panels. You have less heat and thermal pullback in the inverters. They're operating really efficiently, and you can actually exceed the rated output um, if you're, you're in those conditions. But a, a roof, the, 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 fall, the drawback with a roof is that it's very rare that it's perpendicular to the sun. It's only a certain time of day, and it's a certain time of year, really, depending on that fixed angle. So we aim for the best compromise, which is solar south, 194 degrees on the compass. 194 is solar south, not magnetic south. And uh, a pitch that uh, most of our roofs have is a good pitch, like relative, you know, kind of steep, um, not a flat roof, but somewhere between 45 degrees, 12 pitch, and uh, like a 23 degree five pitch. That's where most of our roofs are in New England because they're designed to shed snow. That's actually, those are good angles for solar to, to pick, pick up a lot of power all times of year. Um, I hope that answers your question. Your question is, you're curious why the south side is better than the north side. Are you really serious? Okay. <laughs> no, we do. Um, the sun, uh, in the best time of year, summer solstice, it's not even straight overhead, okay? Because the further north you are of the equator, the, the, the change of us. We get about uh, 70 degrees. 
and in winter time, the sun is 20 degrees at its zenith, the highest point. So it actually moves like a horseshoe in the summertime, and it moves to the south and the background to the northwest. And in the winter time, it's east-west, but it's very low. So if you have a north-facing roof, in the winter time, you will probably have zero production. Um, and in the summertime, it'll be severely diminished. So the, 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 that difference of like 40%, if it was a north roof versus a south roof, it'd be like 70 to 80%, depending on the steepness of the pitch of the roof. I mean, it would be, it's completely unfeasible, really, to put panels on the north side of a roof because the production is so low, it's just wasting money. Good questions. And now it's 7.25, and we have another one. Do you want to, I'm going to back up to a slide. Do you want to handle it first? I'd be happy okay. to. So an average home, as I think I kind of indicated earlier, so an average installation for us, like a, a Nashua home, whatever that is, whether it's a box colonial or a cape, um, they're treated a little differently, but it's about four to $6,000. An average cost, to like your out of pocket could be half of that if you get qualified into that program, but like just straight dollars and cents right to your pocket, what could it cost you for the installation is four to six grand as our average install. Uh, if you get qualified, you'll get through those other things. But that's the most simple, simplistic way to kind of describe it. My pleasure, sir. Okay, and here's a pricing example. This is an average system. So our average installation in New Hampshire is uh, 8,000 watts. Um, that would require about 23 of the LG 350s. Here is a, this is exactly the pricing for solar up. Uh, I'm sorry for for Nashua Solarize Plus, um, and uh, this would be $24,000 before the tax credit. Your home could you could be larger or lower, higher or lower than the average electrical usage, which is one of the things we determine when we get there. Um, so with the tax credit, after that, your net cost would be $16,900. The monthly loan payment, if you were financing it with our lender, VSECU, would be $147. The value of the renewable energy credits, which is that quarterly check based on your production because you're a little green power plant, um, $29. So then your net out of pocket would be about $118 a month. If that's a decently productive roof, um, that's saving you more than $118 worth of electricity per month. So that's what's not shown here. The price is the price, but what you get with solar is the big variable. Yeah, And that's what we have to show you when we give you a proposal. What will you get based on our, our site visit? And hopefully it's, you know, uh, productive enough of a roof that your electricity cost is offset greater than the cost of a loan if you're going looking at it that way. And usually it is. What's the term of that loan? How many years? That is a good question. The question was, what's the term of the loan? That's a 12-year loan, um, fixed rate, no early payment penalties, 3.99 at 3.99 percent. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not sure about per day, but uh, 1.2 is a good roof. So if you have a 8, if you have a 10,000 watt system, it should make 12,000 kilowatt hours a year. The day really varies because there's three usable hours of sunlight in February based on our irradiance and a heck of a lot more in summer, right? So you're, thanks to net metering, you can you don't need to match your usage time frame with the production time frame. You can produce extra in the spring and summer, bank it, net meter it, get credited for winter. So your question is best answered by saying production factor, 1,000 watts will give you 1,200 kilowatt hours if it's a good roof. If it's a great roof, it'll give you 1,300 kilowatt hours, 1 1.3. If it's a poor roof, 1 to 1, 1,000 watts, 1,000 kilowatt hours. Um, if it's a tracker, 1.8. If it's a fixed ground array, perfect, about 1.35. So those are numbers that may be meaningless to you guys, but I see patterns from doing this, and, and I can look at a roof and say about what that's going to make based on how good that, that angle is and what the shade looks like. Um, it should be 
a roof that we would be recommending uh, for a system install, I would say that's a pretty good investment. It would be a lot more than one to one. It's like one point, it'd be 20 to 30% kilowatt hours per year higher than the wattage that's installed. Does that answer your question? Great. Yes. If it's a multifamily home, oh, the question is, um, uh, we're calculating usage for the system design for a homeowner. If it's a multifamily home, do we need the other family's bills? Um, you're raising uh, questions there that are deeper than that because who owns the house? Who owns the roof? Um, if it was owned by you and you are going to take the benefits of the electricity, then we're just going to feed your meter. doesn't matter what the other folks are doing. If you were to on a, a shared... Um, house with two units in it and it was co-ownership of the roof and you both wanted to go in on the, with the solar and both paid half the bill, then we'd look at both of the bills for usage and we would probably even split the strings to provide equal amount of power to both meters and prevent any issues with like who used more electricity than the other person that month. Um, we can totally split the, split the output if we needed to. Um, but oftentimes, uh, on a multifamily, there's a landlord or somebody involved who you can't put a solar array on the roof if, if it's not your ownership of the roof, and that's a different consideration. Uh, yes, in the back. Okay. The question was with battery backup, can it do the whole house or just the fridge? And what does it cost compared to like a generator? I would say that um, the pricing on battery systems, first of all, we des they're designed to really run the whole house. You can run critical loads if you want to. The lowest output battery is 3,000 watts of output, but most of our customers are buying the size that's in the middle and up. It's uh, seven or 8,000 watts of output. So 8,000 watts will do pretty much a whole house as long as you're not heating with geothermal or or um, running a hot tub and a pool and all, you know. You, you, we, will, we will prefer to wire to the entire house and that you determine which critical loads. If you, if you have something that draws a lot of juice, like an electric clothes dryer, yes, it can run off of that in battery, but don't run it if you're in a power outage because you're gonna kill it quick. The, the other part is the capacity, kilowatt hours. So a typical home uses 20 kilowatt hours a day. The, the highest capacity battery is 16 kilowatt hours, which is generally plenty to give you a perpetual motion machine where you're draining it only at night, but then you're recharging during the day when the solar is running, and then you're draining at night. Um, if you had extended cloudy weather, though, it wouldn't keep up. And uh, these batteries can be charged with any AC source. You could wheel out that generator, that portable, fire it up, and charge the battery in a couple hours, and then be good for a couple more days. Um, the pricing on here says that there's an Eco4, it's 8,000 on the lowest tier. We'll go with that because it's an easy number. The Eco4 has four kilowatt hours of capacity and 3,000 watts of output. If you bring that up to an Eco8, um, you're gonna be adding $4,000 in cost and then you're at eight kilowatt hours of capacity and still uh, you're at 4,000 watts. If you go to an Eco10, 7,000 watts. It, sorry, this is going to be confusing, but I have brochures and I have literature. I can sh give you like a whole cut sheet on the different sizes. Um, but they're designed to run a whole home. Okay, it's 7.32. So I think we're past the end of the Q&A, but I'm happy, we're, we're going to hang around before you know, we go and grab something to wet our whistles. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll be here and we'll happily uh, answer any other questions that you have. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, brief, briefly, I do want to share that we do have another uh, information session uh, this Saturday uh, at Elm Street Middle School Auditorium here in Nashua. Uh, it will start uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, and I'm hoping that she'll tell your friends and family about it uh, and your neighbors because you want a really high tier discount for this program. So uh, please feel free to recruit people uh, to join the campaign. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, I hope you all have a great evening.